Kia ora koutou. Welcome everyone, my name is Maria and I work as the electrical and wind engineer for Antarctica New Zealand. So I'm not sure if many of you attended the 14th ComNAP Symposium, but at that symposium we introduced the new microgrid that we had um, recently established between Antarctica New Zealand and the United States Antarctic Program at Ross Island. Um, and we also introduced the new wind farm that had recently been built. Um, so today I'll be covering um, the operation of those new assets in that time since and provide an update um, on any lessons we've learnt and success that we've managed to achieve through collaboration. So why would we collaborate? Um, as Stuart mentioned on earlier on, we have this ongoing logistics challenge. So it does make it easier in that we have collaborated on a number of fronts and kind of moving that focus to energy and how we supply our bases was kind of a natural progression. Um, we also um, serve to benefit from keeping care of the environment we both operate in within. So as a reminder of what the Ross Island Energy Grid is, it's a small electrical network at Ross Island. Um, there are a number of, uh, there are a number of diesel generators across McMurdo Station. Uh, they're at Scott Base, owned by each Antarctic program. And then the three wind turbines at Crater Hill. Um, additionally, we also have a power store, which was a um, small battery um, facility, and a frequency converter, which enabled the conversion of 60 hertz electricity to 50 hertz um, to make it suitable for um, New Zealand consumption. So each month, um, the user group meets in a virtual capacity, and we discuss... Um, any issues or forthcoming plans with um, the pieces of plant and their availability. Um, and I guess this diagram also kind of depicts the, the typical configuration. So we have our three wind turbines available, um, but also typically would have two um, generators operating at McMurdo over the summer, and then um, one or two um, generators available at Scott Base um, ready for use. So also a um, reminder on the wind turbines we use, we have a number of Enercon E33 units, um, similar to a number of other programs. Uh, I know the Germans and Australians have a uh, similar brand. Um, and they've worked well over the past 13 years. Um, so they have a hub height, 37 metres, and a rotor diameter of about 34 metres. So something I uh, missed earlier, Okay. Um, was that the small battery component that we have within our grid, which we called the power store, unfortunately has failed. Um, and that was due to the failure of a non-replaceable part. So that has significantly limited our ability to um, use our wind turbines to their fullest capacity. So in 2019, we've had to curtail our wind farm to about 33% of its full potential. Um, and yeah, I guess this means that if we didn't do that, there would just be an incre increased chance of a blackout on the grid, um, which isn't what we want. We want a stable, a stable grid. So I guess over the last 13 years, um, we've really kind of honed in on how we operate our turbines and have put together um, a quite standardised procedure to how we approach the turbines. So firstly, we, we check the wind turbines remotely, make sure there's no alarms or indications um, on the SCADA, which is the, um, I guess, like the human machine interface um, from Scott Base to check there's nothing, no issues before we approach the turbine. Um, we then confirm that we have got a rescue team uh, available and they're not really allowed to leave base. They need to be on call and ready, to, ready for action. 
Um, we get our permit to work issued by the engineering supervisor. We get a comms plan logged with our comms operator. We check our radios before heading to site. And of course, we use a lock and tag out process when we open the circuit breaker so that there's no possibility that the wind turbine could be generating electricity and inadvertently expose your personnel to that electricity um, generation. Um, and finally, you buddy check before climbing. So I guess the design process of the wind farm is um, something we went through uh, in 2007, or rather Meridian did, um, and it's something we're going through at the moment with the Scott Base Redevelopment Project. But a couple of things that you may want to consider if your program is considering wind. Um, so think about how good is your wind resource. Um, luckily at Scott Base it's quite laminar and um, high, so around seven and a half uh, metres per second. Uh, so what are the environmental considerations? Are the spinning turbines going to have a shadow flicker effect on nearby buildings? Is it going to cause a lot of bird strike issues? Um, and is it going to uh, put potential noise on nearby surrounds? Um, what are your foundations going to look like? And what are your logistics like? Because a lot of the, these turbines are quite heavy. Um, Finally, I guess you definitely want to consider the cold climate design and whilst the Intercon turbines are certified or were designed for negative 35 degrees Celsius, we needed to probably check that that was the case for all of the components. And finally, what's the maintenance regime going to look like? So for us, um, we managed to operate um, like a kind of split maintenance regime where we have our own in-house contractors performing uh, the more basic tasking, so that's regreasing of components, whereas we also bring in the Intercon, Intercon specialist technicians to perform annual maintenance. So something I touched on er earlier was the cold climate considerations. Um, so soon after commissioning, uh, in 2010, we found that uh, the turbines had actually been set to derate it negative 20 degrees instead of the negative 35 that they were designed for. So this means that they would just turn off uh, much earlier than they were supposed to. Um, luckily it was a pretty straightforward settings change, but I guess when you're handing over um, projects you want to try and test them in all the possible conditions, I guess when the turbines were commissioned it was in the middle of the Antarctic summer, so conditions below negative 20 hadn't really been tested just yet. Um, additionally, in 2018, when we were doing a maintenance review, we found that internal ladders were only rated to negative 20, so we decided as a precaution that we'd stop performing maintenance year-round and um, just concentrate on the annual maintenance, and that yeah, severely limited our um, ability to access the turbines during the middle of winter. Um, we've subsequently replaced the ladders now, um, so that's great. Um, but yeah, definitely something to be cautious of when you're thinking about introducing any asset really to Antarctica. Something else I um, wanted to talk about was a dropped tool incident we had in 2017. Um, this was luckily a near miss um, and a torque wrench fell from the tower right at the top. So a torque wrench weighs about two kgs but once it kind of travels down 30 metres of tower, it's about equivalent to like a Waddell seal kind of like sitting, sitting on you, so um, that's the kind of equivalent force. Um, but the changes that we've made as a result from that incident is that we only use the external winch for carrying or lifting gears up to the top of the tower, so all the turbines have that. Um, we make sure to pack the tools securely into lifting bags before doing so. Uh, we implement a drop do zone and we have a dogman keeping um, tab of the, the load when it lifts up. Um, finally, we also ensure that all the hatches are closed before or as we climb turbines. Um, yeah. So, as mentioned earlier across the Ross Island energy grid, there are a number of caterpillars are a number of Caterpillar fuel generators, um, and these have been derated to use AN8 or JP8 fuel. So, I think I already mentioned, we have five generators available or at McMurdo Station, there are three at Scott Base. 
um, where it's possible, the two programs try and pull their resources together. So for the seasons 2020, 2020 to 2021 and 21, 22 seasons, um, we were able to use the same contractors, which definitely helps us save seats. And then during day-to-day -day operations, we, there's definitely in-kind lending across the programs and um, borrowing of, of parts. In 2014, um, we undertook a prog program at ScottBase to enable um, automation of the ScottBase generators. So the McMurdo generators already had this capability. We were just kind of playing catch up. Um, so automating them just meant that they were available to be called on by the rest of the grid as um, like yes, peaking units or peak lopping units. Um, and I guess this was quite a revelation because prior to that, what had been happening is that often two generators at McMurdo would be in operation when one and one at Scott Base would have more than sufficed. So it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's a straightforward program, but the controls and automation of it um, has definitely saved uh, the program a lot of fuel, or both programs rather. Yeah. And I guess there are a couple of other benefits as well. Um, we've managed to also recover a lot of that thermal heat because at Scott Base because the generators are running a bit more frequently. Um, there are lower run times on the McMurdo generators and it simplifies operations of um, actually getting the Scott Base generators going in the first place, which is good for our operators. So similar to that cold climate learning I um, discussed earlier, um, we've also found that some planned maintenance must be performed in warmer weather, so over the summit period, and that's just due to the like, cold weather limitations of some of the equipment we've, we installed initially. So, for example, in July 2014, so the middle of winter, um, some planned maintenance was undertaken to make improvements on sections of overhead line, which was close to this transition um, off a high-voltage cable, but Due to the installation temperature or limitations off the high voltage cable, which is negative 10 degrees, which is relatively warm, um, it later caused a cable fault to develop and a small cable piece of cable to fail, which in turn caused a blackout. So I guess subsequent to this event, any maintenance that is required on the high voltage cable or um, yeah, is planned for the main operational period between October to February, um, when it's both warmer and specialist high-voltage contractors are available to be flown south. So what outcomes can we draw after operating a wind farm for 13 years? So, yeah, we've had some periods of inoperability during the past and we've had to work, overcome issues and work together to get through this. The figure shows the lifetime wind energy generated per year, and against, that's against the forecast value in red. Um, there are always going to be unforeseen issues that you encounter, so I guess just take heed of that. Um, try and plan for um, all the use cases you can. But I guess there, with the performance off a wind farm, um, there are always a number of variables, including the wind availability, um, the turbine availability, the reliability of the grid you're pushing your electricity into. Um, and I guess it shows that even with perfect wind turbine availability, there are times when the actual output performed or underperformed against the design forecast. So in 2014, we um, talked about that high voltage cable issue that we had. So that kind of explains that period of time. But then in subsequent years, it was still below the forecast, so that's kind of unexplained. And then 2019 onwards, um, we've had the failure of the power store, so that's kind of explains that. Um, and I guess reflecting on um, this graph as well, it does show that a mix of renewables, so not just relying on wind or um, if you wanted to be fully renewable, kind of makes the most sense. Um, and this one shows the energy share between McMurdo and, 
and Scott Base, and then also um, the losses that we experience um, due to just the small distance between the wind turbines and um, the places where the energy is being consumed. Um, it also reflects the um, disparity in power demand between the two stations. I guess McMurdo Station's a lot bigger than us, so they're in a way better position to be able to utilise um, that renewable energy instantaneously. Um, they support up to 1,200 people in summer, um, whereas at Scott Base we have, a, at the moment, a peak of about 89 persons. So, in conclusion... In conclusion... Yeah, operating microgrid assets in Antarctica is not without challenge. Um, it's made easier through working together, and um, hopefully the shared experience of operating a microgrid over the past 13 years will help inform other programs, infrastructure, infrastructure modernisation projects. Thanks very much.